or other members of Code Pink physically threaten Henry Kissinger? No, not unless you consider um, chants and small pieces of paper to be physically threatening. I mean, why didn't they name it the war on Al-Qaeda, which was a narrow, focused engagement uh, if Al-Qaeda had been the group that attacked the United States on 9-11, well, why not have a war on Al-Qaeda? He said they had a war on terror. And you may remember Bush said, there is no space and no time. This is a timeless, spaceless war. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. We'd like to welcome viewers on Cape Media 99 in Upper Cape Cod, Massachusetts. The struggle is now shown on 27 different stations from Vermont to New York City. We also have a YouTube channel with 1,500 videos that you can see 24-7. It's called Struggle Video Media. However you view us, we'd like to hear from you. For a private thought, send us an email at mail at thestruggle.org. If you have a comment that you'd like the public to see, we have a Facebook page. It's called Struggle Video. Go to that page and you can make a comment about our program. You can shower us with praise or you can start a dialogue. We start the program with information about another war flashpoint in Ukraine. The Russian Empire is gorging on the Crimea and eastern Ukraine, and the U.S. Empire can't wait to get involved in the feast. You would think that after disasters in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and Yemen, our 1% would stop and do some soul-searching. No such luck. For the power elite, expansion and force is always the answer. Rather than use the collapse of the Soviet Union as an opportunity for peace and prosperity, U.S. presidents have used it as a way to expand into Eastern Europe. They want military bases right next to Russia's border and constantly seek to expand NATO. On Democracy Now!, scholar Stephen Cohen explained that our elite wants us fully involved in the Ukraine bloodletting. On Monday, three prominent U.S. think tanks, the Brookings Institution, the Atlantic Council, and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs issued a joint report urging the United States to provide Ukraine $3 billion in military assistance over the next three years. Former Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot co-wrote the report. He's now president of Brookings. In the context of what is happening in Ukraine today, the right way to characterize it is an act of war on the part of the Russian Federation. This means that there is going on in Ukraine today a literal invasion, not by, it's not a proxy war, it's a little, literal invasion by the Russian armed forces. It's a literal occupation of large parts, well beyond Crimea, of eastern Ukraine, and it is a virtual annexation of a lot of territory other than just the Crimea. And in that respect, this is a major threat to the peace of Europe, to the peace of Eurasia, and therefore a threat to the interests of the United States, and I would say a threat to the chances of a peaceful 21st century. That's former Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot, now President of Brookings. Your response? Well, he's much more than that. Uh, people need to drop their masks and say what their personal stake in this is. Strobe Talbot, whom I've known for years, was the architect of the American policy <coughs> that led to this crisis. He was the Russia hand, as he called his memoir, under President Clinton, when the expansion of NATO toward Russia began. Understand what he said, and the roll out of this report has been coming. And if you look at the signatures, these are the leaders of the American War Party, the people who literally want a military showdown with Russia. Stop and think what that means. 
Stop and think what that means, as though Russia is going to back off. But the people who signed this report, and they've been bringing it out for days, are saying that the, he literally just said this. The future of the 21st century is at stake in Ukraine. Stop and think what that means. Then he went on to say things that are fundamentally untrue, that Russia has invaded and annexed eastern Ukraine. I mean, when the State Department was asked a few weeks ago, can you fir confirm the, pres the presence of Russian troops in eastern Ukraine, uh, the State Department, which misleads about this story all the time, said, no, we cannot. So what are, this is what I'm talking about, the fog of war, uh, where we're being told Russia's the next eastern Ukraine, the, state, the stake of the world is at, at uh, the future of the world is at stake here, and basically they're calling for war with Russia. Even the New York Times featured an op-ed by billionaire George Soros and pro-war philosopher Bernard-Henri Levy called Save the New Ukraine. Let me state the obvious. The United States is not under attack in Ukraine. It has no reason to be involved in another war. Realize this would not be another third world adventure. This is Russia. It would be stupidity on steroids. Now to the halls of Washington. Senator John McClain has declared activists from Code Pink low-life scum for interrupting his hearing and declaring that former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger was a war criminal for his actions from Vietnam to Chile. Here is part of a Skype interview I did with Ali McCracken, National Director of Code Pink, who took part in their citizen's arrest. Did you or other members of Code Pink physically threaten Henry Kissinger? No, no. Not unless you consider um, chants and small pieces of paper to be physically threatening. We, we didn't even come close uh, to being near. Well, we were close to him, but we, we didn't touch um, Henry Kissinger, and we, we had no plans to ever touch him. So, uh, no, we did not physically assault him. D describe the whole action, then. Um, so last week, the Senate Armed Services Committee was having a hearing where they brought in um, expert witnesses such as Madeleine Albright, George Schultz, and Henry Kissinger to talk about uh, American leadership in the world and global security strategy. Um, and, you know, we were, we were horrified that those people were being brought in, especially Henry Kissinger, who's um, you know, a, a known war criminal and is uh, there's an arrest worn out for him in several countries, uh, you know, that our government was bringing them in to talk about these issues during such a, um, a volatile time uh, for American foreign policy. And so at the hearing, we went up to the front of the room when Henry Kissinger walked in and we held up our banners and our, we chanted uh, arrest Henry Kissinger for war crimes. And then as soon as the hearing began, we sat down. Uh, and then partway through when Kissinger was providing his testimony, uh, my colleague Anna Kaminsky and I stood up and read out loud the citizen's arrest warrant, which listed um, briefly some of his crimes uh, and, and the, the massacres that he's responsible for in places like Vietnam and Chile and Cambodia and Laos. Um, and that's when we were taken out of the room by Capitol Hill Police and we were not arrested. But it was after the initial um disruption that that senator mccain um told us to shut up and that we were low life scum uh which we found to be very disrespectful now there was uh, a picture of, with some handcuffs you haven't mentioned that what what uh they were draped near him or on him what, what was that? yeah well it was me holding those handcuffs and i i the the picture that's been circulating on the internet is a is a deceiving angle. It looks like the handcuffs are actually draped across him, but they're not. Um, they're about a foot and a half away from his face, um, just to the left of him. Um, so that was all part of the attempt to um, perform the citizen's arrest. You didn't try to uh, tell him to put his hands behind his back and, and go assume the position. <laughs> no, he was busy chanting with the, the rest of the crew that we needed to arrest him. 
Well, let's talk a little bit more about uh, Kissinger. I, I, I was gratified to see that on uh, maybe your Facebook page, you had something in Spanish to uh, talk to people from Chile. Talk, talk about Chile and Kissinger. Yeah, so we know that Kissinger was instrumental in the overthrow of Allende in Chile and then the installation of the brutal dictator Pinochet. Um, and so we wanted to um, specifically mention that during the citizen's arrest. And my friend Anna read that segment out loud of the arrest warrant um, Medea had put together. Um, and we wanted, uh, we posted on our Facebook page a, a specific shout out to the people there to know, so that they know that there are Americans who haven't forgotten what happened and the role of American politicians in that, um, the installation of that dictatorship. For the full interview, go to our website or our podcast. Also, see if you can find the February 3rd Bill O'Reilly TV show. Medea Benjamin of Code Pink was on it, and she explained the attempted citizen's arrest, as well as answered O'Reilly's, O'Reilly's question on what she would do in the face of ISIS gruesome murders. Trinity professor and author Vijay Prashad spoke on Democracy Now! this week. That reminded me we had some excellent coverage of a talk he gave last fall. He gives an analysis of 13 years of the war on terror, 13 years of failure. Here's a good piece of it. Let's go back just a little bit because this has actually now become history. I mean, how many of you remember that George Bush used to be the president of the United States? It seems like years ago. <clears throat> you know, it's amazing. It was only six years ago that George W. Bush was the president of the United States. And ever since he disappeared and started painting his pictures of himself lying in the bathtub, you know, it was the weirdest kind of portraits. The president, ex-president paints pictures of himself in a bathtub. You know, have you seen these pictures? You really need to go on, you know, that great invention called Google and type in George W. Bush bathtub painting. You know, it's an actual thing, a hobby that he has. Okay, and he, he also paints dogs and other things. So there actually was a president called George W. Bush. It really seems so far away that I, I forget what it felt like to live under the regime of Bush. And I always used to think, you know, I've lived under a number of American presidents, and it's really un it's not possible that there would come a time when each one, as they leave, evokes from me nostalgia. When Bush was in power, I used to look back and think, Clinton, you know, was bad, but not as bad as this. Then there was Obama, and I'm thinking, man, the days of George W. Bush, it was paradise. You know, then you didn't have to have these irritating conversations with liberals about, you know, but he's good, or, you know, there's, he's good on abortion. You know, so it doesn't matter if he kills thousands of people, you know, drone attacks. He's great on the Supreme Court. You know, with Bush, Bush there was no conversation like that. Everybody said, this guy's terrible, you know. So I look back nostalgically. But what was Bush's strategy vis-a-vis -vis the war on terror? Which, interestingly, wasn't called the war on, war on Al-Qaeda, which it could have been. I mean, why didn't they name it the war on Al-Qaeda, which was a narrow, focused engagement. Uh, if Al-Qaeda had been the group that attacked the United States on 9-11, well, why not have a war on Al-Qaeda? He said they had a war on terror. And you may remember Bush said, there is no space and no time. This is a timeless, spaceless war. We can prosecute this war anywhere, at any time. There is no boundary to this war. And I think, therefore, they didn't name it the war on Al-Qaeda, but the war on terror. Let's just rehearse the battlefields of the war on terror, just for our own elucidation. There was Afghanistan. That spilled into Pakistan, and we called it AFPAC. Then there was Yemen. Then there was Iraq. Then there was, of course, Somalia, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, because that's a very important battlefield. Maybe um, if we add on some of the other places, you know, Philippines, whatever, let's leave all those aside. The heart of the war on terror was prosecuted in three to four countries. Three to four because Afghanistan and then Pakistan, it's sort of an adjutant. It wasn't really a war on Pakistan, but Pakistan was the spillover. You had Iraq, you had Yemen, and you had Somalia. So these four with, it, sorry, it could have been a fifth country, but let's add the two together. It's been 13 years, 
and the United States has had at least three different approaches to these four wars. In some of the countries, the United States directly invaded. And of course, those were Afghanistan and Iraq, where there was a direct US invasion. In some of the countries, uh, proxies went in. For instance, in Somalia, the proxy was the Ethiopian army. I mean, how many of you uh, remember that at the behest of the United States, Ethiopia occupied Somalia in the 2000s for three years? You know, it was that common knowledge that the Ethiopian army actually invaded Somalia and occupied it for three years at the behest of the United States. So that was the second strategy. First strategy was American troops on the ground. Second strategy was you had a, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, a proxy force enter and occupy. And the third strategy has been, of course, the drone war or aerial bombardment. And there, the example, of course, the best example is Yemen. But also Pakistan, where instead of either going in directly with massive troop presence or having a proxy army do your work for you, you have aerial bombardment. These three seem to me the three different strat strategic utilization of force in these four different areas in the war on terror. Well, how did that work out? Let's just do an audit, as smart people do. Well, Afghanistan, the uh, different groups like the International Crisis Group and others have demonstrated that despite 13 years of uh, a lot of money and an enormous amount of firepower, the Taliban remains popular. So there we have it. Uh, we went to war. Uh, I'm not sure if Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan has been wiped out. They may be around, but they're really irrelevant. The Taliban certainly is ready to make a comeback. And in southern Afghanistan, in Helmand, and in the provinces that are sort of this arc uh, in southern Afghanistan where the opium grows wildly, uh, the Taliban is very popular. And if there's an election and they decided to compete, I think they do pretty well. And it's therefore fascinating that um, John Kerry had to go into democratic Afghanistan and take the two rival politicians who couldn't agree on the election result and force them to do a compromise. I don't know if you followed this, but the current president of Afghanistan is a man by the name of Ashraf Ghani. He's a very decent man, nice man, polished his shoes at the World Bank. Uh, you know, is now, uh, was very happy to sign the long-term agreement to retain American forces in Afghanistan. Unlike his predecessor, Hamid Karzai, Karzai was interesting because he started off as a stooge of the Americans and then experience taught him what American power was like and he ended up being this kind of crazy critic of American power who, you know, is being sort of wheeled out of the Afghan presidential palace and in his place comes Ashraf Ghani, very sophisticated guy, totally. Pro Meanwhile, once again, after 13 years, the leader of Afghanistan is essentially the leader of a very small district of Kabul. So that's what 13 years of the war on terror in Afghanistan has produced. That's the first strategy, send lots of troops. The other country where the send lots of troops operated was, of course, Iraq, which turned out to be abysmal because against international law, uh, Paul Bremer, long forgotten man, passed two orders, order number one and order number two. Order number one and two disbanded the Iraqi military, which is illegal under the Geneva Convention, and secondly, fired everybody who had a Ba'ath Party card. Also illegal, actually, under the Geneva Convention. <laughs> Occupying powers cannot change the basis of a society. Anyway, having done those things, you created an enormous constituency that was going to hate you. So, for instance, i just give you a, a sense of the Islamic State. The Islamic State that emerges in 2004 and then really in 2006 in Iraq is not just a bunch of ragtag jihadis who are from Chechnya, from the Philippines, from wherever. The reason they are so good at battlefield uh, fights, set piece battles, is that the leadership, the sergeants, the captains, the lieutenants are all Iraqi army people. They are highly sophisticated military people. They know how to take a bunch of ragtag fighters and discipline them. You know, this is not the kind of Al-Qaeda fighting that you saw at Tora Bora, you know, where they just sort of ran down the hill firing their guns and 50 people were shot. These people understand how to fight. So the Iraq situation turned out terribly because the way in which the troops operated on the ground was they brought in this exiled force totally alienated from their 
from Iraqi complexity, that is the Dawa party, and hand it to uh, people like Nuri al-Maliki, and now his successor, who used to be a spokesman, but is much more personable, Mr. al Haider, hand it over to them, the power of the state, and said, now you govern, and allowed them to govern in a sectarian way. In fact, you know, helped them along with that. So the two examples of US troops on the ground turn out terrible. In one, the Taliban remains popular, and in the second, well, the Ba'ath Party, in alliance with the emergent Al-Qaeda types, have created this group called the Islamic State. You know, there's a guy who used to be, I think, the ace of clubs in Bush's, you know, cards. Remember those cards? You know, the ace of something was Saddam, and then you went down. Well, the ace of clubs was never caught, and that was Izzat al-Duri, who was an interesting character, Mr. al-Duri, uh, was a leader of an organization of a, you know, of a religious order called the Naqshbandi uh, order. And you know, in South Asia, Naqshbandis are famous Sufis and they like to sing and they have a whole wonderful... But in, in Iraq, the Naqshbandis went in a different direction. And he, in 2006, created this Naqshbandi army, Jayash al-Naqshbandi, and they became basically the Islamist Ba'athists, weird kind of Ba'athism that they created, and that was the basis of their alliance. Didn't work out very well in that scenario either. The second technique that the United States used, of course, was a proxy army. Well, um, you may have seen the movie Black Hawk Down. Terrible movie, but great to watch, actually. Uh, you know, it was really exciting. <laughs> and you really want the Americans to win. I mean, all these movies are such setups. You know, you go see them, and however much you're against, against war, you're like, just come on, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real setup, you know. Anyway, so this is a, it's a great film. It's a very well-made film, because it's totally manipulative. But when you watch uh, Black Hawk Down, you see that Somalia, by the early 90s, was already a society just broken by warlordism for a whole bunch of reasons I don't have time to get into now. But it was a society broken by warlordism for many reasons. Just as in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, you know, the parallels between Afghanistan and Somalia are incredible. In Afghanistan, when the Soviets pulled out, the Soviets entered Afghanistan in 1978, pulled out in 1988. The communist government in Kabul lasted till 96. So even the pullout of Soviet troops in 88, still for eight years, the communist government of Najibullah remained in power. Uh, during those, that period, those eight years, essentially, Afghanistan became a warlord society. Because groups led by Ahmad Shah Massoud, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, I mean, these are all gangsters, Buruddin Rabani, were basically firing you know, uh, stinger missiles into cities and it, at each other. And against them, a group was formed in the camps in Pakistan called Taliban. And the, you know, Taliban means students. And they formed with the pledge, with the help of Pakistani intelligence, to create stability in, in Afghanistan. And that's how they enter Afghanistan in the early 90s, to bring stability. In the same way, in Somalia, there were two groups formed. One was the Islamic Courts Union who's pledged, led by an interesting character called Sheikh Sharif, who becomes important for US policy aims. But the Islamic Courts Union was interesting because they also pledged that we will found a society in Somalia based on Islamic principles and get rid of warlords. In the same way as the Taliban had said, we will get rid of gangsterism. We want to found a stable society. Next to the Islamic Courts was a group called Al-Shabaab, which you've heard of. Now, you may not know that Al-Shabaab in Arabic simply means the youth, just like Taliban means the students. So these were younger people who said, we are going to make a stable society. We're fed up with warlords, extortion, things like that. So they enter with a political message. Now, it's true, both the Taliban and Al-Shabaab suffer from a lack of imagination. I mean, you know, these are the kind of people like the Islamic State who have been walking around Raqqa telling people, don't use diapers, because the Prophet does not want excreta to remain close to our body. You know, I mean, for people who work, for mothers who work, this is an inconvenient thing. You know, this new ruling about diapers is not a convenient good thing. So these kids suffer from a lack of imagination, but they come at their politics, essentially, with a very strong position against instability. And they gain popularity. Well, what the Americans did was when Al-Shabaab and the Islamic courts in particular started gaining popularity, urged Ethiopia <coughs> to invade Somalia. 
Now, that's the second method. Remember, the first method was you send your own troops. Second method is you send a proxy force. But when the Ethiopians came in, it was really a bad idea. Firstly, Ethiopia is largely a Christian country. And uh, Somalia is largely a Muslim country. And the Americans back this Christian country to attack a Muslim country. It looks bad. I mean, and it's easy to use. By all metrics, Al-Shabaab emerges as the liberation force, as the force of the Somalis against the invader. That's how they position themselves. There's a Human Rights Watch report, or maybe it's an amnesty report, which talked about how Ethiopian troops were slaughtering Somalis like goats, was the phrase, on the street. I mean, brutal occupation. It lasted three years. Didn't work out well. Al-Shabaab's popularity increased. Uh, Sharif, who the Americans first said is a terrorist, you know, when he was with the Islamic Courts Union, then becomes the American guy to become president. So the guy that you call the president, the terrorist is now your president. You know, the games that are played in Somalia are extraordinarily bad. And American foreign policy there, utilizing that second strategy, proxy force invasion, utter failure. Third technique, aerial bombing. The best example, of course, is Yemen, where Gregory Johnson, who's a terrific scholar, uh, I think he's at Princeton University, um, wrote a book about Yemen called The Last Refuge, which is a very good, very simple, very easy to read book. Greg, uh, Gregory demonstrates in this book that by 2003, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula had vanished, had essentially gone. Mr. Abdullah al-Saleh, the president of Yemen, was a smart guy. I mean, this guy could play the Americans like nobody. I mean, he, for, for him, the Americans were the Stradivarius, whatever it is, violin. I mean, this guy knew that the more he says, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda, the Americans are going to give him money, and they're going to let him do anything. And he went after his domestic opponents in the name of fighting Al-Qaeda. And of course, as Gregory Johnson documents, <coughs> Al-Qaeda grows. To see the complete talk, go to thestruggle.org and go to our video section. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.